The early 1900s are known for an expansion of petrol engines, mainly in the automotive business. However, it was also a time of various experiments, some of which gained traction, while others did not. Diesel is one of those technologies that succeeded, whereas jet engines tell a different story. As the world later discovered, the aviation industry was ideal for turbines, whereas automobiles, though in close proximity, proved to be an unviable idea. Chrysler invested millions of dollars and decades of work, which eventually faded into a memory, leaving only a few unscrapped cars of immense historic value. The inception of the turbine engine development at Chrysler took place in the late 1930s. The company secured a US government contract to create a turboprop shaft aviation engine, which was soon cancelled. Nevertheless, many internal engineers remained intrigued by the turbine automobile concept and continued exploring it. One such engineer was George Hübner, a longtime Chrysler employee and a graduate in mechanical engineering. The turbine engine idea wasn't merely an enthusiast attempt to create a cool car. It offered numerous advantages over a gasoline automobile. These included significantly fewer engine parts, reducing complexity, easy and less frequent maintenance, the potential elimination of oil changes due to minimal contamination, no need for engine cooling and easier cold starts even in winter. However, engineers faced multiple challenges that they endeavored to mitigate or overcome over the years. In the 1950s, Serious discussions about gas turbine automobile engine development led to action. With a dedicated engineering team, Chrysler introduced the CR1, the first generation engine producing 100 horsepower. Notably, it was compact enough for the engine bay, but it came with several drawbacks. It lacked engine braking capabilities, and its throttle response was remarkably slow, with a 9 second delay between input and significant acceleration. Simultaneously, the CR1 faced issues such as unacceptable fuel consumption and the challenge of managing intense heat from the turbine outlet, reaching temperatures up to 1200 degrees of Fahrenheit or 650 degrees of Celsius at idle. Other companies also joined the pursuit, with anecdotes suggesting that Ford's gas turbine Thunderbird had the potential to set grass on fire due to the emitted heat simply by going by. Despite the hurdles, engineers persisted in developing the technology with common or inexpensive materials to ensure affordability for the market. In 1954, Chrysler successfully tested the engine in a Plymouth Belvedere, and two years later, George Hubner achieved a milestone by completing a cross-county trip with the innovative engine. Recognizing the limitations of the first generation, Chrysler initiated development of the CR2, aiming to address issues such as high exhaust temperatures. They incorporated a regenerator device into the design, acting as a heat exchanger to transfer heat from the exhaust to the air intake, thus assisting with ignition. This innovation not only helped lower exhaust temperatures, but also improved fuel economy, increasing from 13 to 18 miles per gallon from 18 to 13 liters per 100 kilometers. Testing took place in a 1957 Plymouth Fury, covering distances ranging from hundreds to thousands of miles. Yep, that's the turbine. The CR2A, research between 1960 and 1962, marked the third generation and represented a significant leap forward. The use of more suitable materials, coupled with the introduction of variable turbine vanes, addressed the issue of massive turbo lag. Although a one and a half second lag time still existed, it was considerably more acceptable compared to the early stages of development, and the exhaust temperatures were much cooler at 482 degrees of Fahrenheit, 250 degrees of Celsius. Designed with future production in mind, 
The CR2A considered materials and production procedures. It found its place in the 1962 Dodge Dart and underwent testing in a 1967 Dodge two-ton state truck. The CR2A was also featured in a concept car, the 1961 Chrysler Turboflight, seen by some as a glimpse into the future. With 140 horsepower and a substantial torque output of up to 375 pound-feet, 508 Nm, meters, the engine weighed approximately 150 to 450 pounds less than a comparable piston engine. Paired with the regular automatic transmission, the engine was designed in a way to function as its own torque converter. By this time, engineers had achieved an engine lifespan of over 5000 hours. The successful long-distance testing trips of the previous generation, coupled with substantial public interest, motivated Chrysler to advance turbine engine development further. The company introduced a new generation, the AA31, advertised as capable of consuming various fuels, including diesel, unleaded gasoline, kerosene, jet fuel, as well as unconventional options like perfumes, plant oils and alcohol, it produced 130 horsepower and slightly more torque than the CR2A at 425 pound-feet, 576 Nm, achieving peak power at 36,000 rpm, a noteworthy accomplishment with an exhaust temperature at idle reaching only 180 degrees of Fahrenheit, 82 degrees of Celsius. Emissions were significantly cleaner compared to a piston engine, lacking carbon dioxide, unburned carbon or raw hydrocarbons, but it did produce a notable amount of nitrogen oxides, the primary emission challenge of the turbine project. By 1962, the A831 was ready for road car testing by the general public. Initially contemplating selling the first batch of 55 cars to specific individuals for maximum promotional impact, Chrysler ultimately decided to loan them free of charge for a three-month period. The turbine car boasted several advantages, including a short learning curve even for laymen, vibration-free operation and simple maintenance. Engineers claimed one could place a nickel on top of it and it would stand. On the flip side, it exhibited sluggish acceleration, below average fuel consumption and a distinct noise unfamiliar for conventional expectations. 60% positively perceived, and about 20% the other way. It simply did not sound like the familiar V8 engines. The Chrysler turbine had a top speed of approximately 120 miles per hour, with the turbine running at its maximum of 60,000 rpm. Its combustor achieved an impressive 95% efficiency. The turbine was easy to start even at the ambient temperature as low as minus 20 degrees of Fahrenheit, minus 29 degrees of Celsius, and essentially did not require external cooling system or periodic oil changes. Its power count peaked at about 60 compared to 300 for a regular, comparable piston engine. The Chrysler Turbine stands as the most renowned achievement in automobile jet engine development. Unfortunately, the majority of these cars were claimed by Chrysler, citing concerns about future serviceability and as a precaution against potential engine swaps with traditional piston engines. Despite decades of development and promotion, almost all the retrieved cars were ultimately destroyed in 1967, leaving only nine in existence now housed in museums or private collections, including Jay Leno's. Subsequent generations were developed, with government funding aiding in their final completion and road homologation, particularly in addressing mission concerns. It's reported that these challenges were successfully overcome, and various models such as the 1964 Plymouth Fury, 1966 Dodge Coronet, a prototype of the Dodge Charger, Dodge Aspen and the 1980 Chrysler Baron were said to have received variations of the jet engine. The 1980 Chrysler Baron in particular was reportedly well prepared for production, boasting around 100 horsepower 
and featuring a Gen 7 engine. In retrospect, the production version of the Chrysler Turbine was estimated to cost about four times the price tag of a Corvette at the time, with inferior fuel economy and dynamics. Despite the Chrysler Baron being seemingly close to production readiness, the project was officially terminated in 1979. This marked the end of the possibility of a production gas turbine engine. On a different note, a gas turbine production motorcycle did make its way to the market, but that's a topic for another discussion.